Good morning and welcome to Inside the Newport Mansions. My name is Trudy Cox. I am the director of the Preservation Society and today's guest is a superstar. Um, Bob Shaw is a man who knows Newport very well now because he has been the production designer and director of all of the scenes, the great, great scenes that you have been enjoying in the great TV show by HBO, The Gilded Age. Bob has a very impressive resume. He was nominated for an Academy Award for the best achievement in production design for his work on Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. He has won primetime Emmys for Mad Men and for Boardwalk Empires. He has earned three primetime Emmy nominations for his work on The Sopranos. I know Bob loved working on that. He has film credits that include The Wolf of Wall Street and Die Hard with a Vengeance. And anyone who has watched the first season of Gilded Age knows that his quality of work, the artistic ability of Mr. Shaw is incredible. So I am delighted to welcome you, Bob. Um, Bob is actually going to be here as a guest speaker at the John G. Winslow Lecture, which is on the 11th of August. So anyone who wants to meet him in person will have a chance, but welcome Bob to the show. I'm gonna go out and ask a very, very simplistic question. And that is for all of us who don't really understand the term production or set designer, what are you and how did you get into this field? A production designer is, is different than a set designer. I, I started in theater and that is where the job is set design. The difference with production designer is that you're not responsible just for the things that are built or the things that are on stage, but you're involved with creating a look that also involves the use of locations and then trying to decide what you will film on location and, and what you will build on the sound stage. Um, I got into this because when I was young in high school, I was equally interested in art and music and I didn't really know what to pursue. And somewhere along the line, because of playing the French horn, I developed an interest in opera. And I developed this theory that if I designed scenery for operas and musicals and that sort of thing, that it would combine my interest in music and art. So I decided that I wanted to be a set designer for theater when I was about 16 and um, got some very lucky breaks along the way. So I was able to start doing it relatively soon. And for those young for people listening, if they, they are thinking about an academic uh, career, where do they, what do you study to become a well, designer? My path was a little different. Um, I had learned that uh, most people who do what I do, do have a master's degree and um, the lion's share of them are from either NYU or, or Yale. Um, I uh, thought that I needed art training first and I figured I would go to undergraduate uh, school. I went to Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn as an art student. And then I figured I would have to go uh, to for grad school, but I got extremely lucky. I did a show at Pratt um, and the director was a student of a director who taught at Sarah Lawrence named Wilfred Leach. And he asked me, did I want to work on a show? And I started working with him, which led to very early opportunities like designing the, the Linda Ronstadt revival of the Pirates of Penzance mm -hmm. and the original production of the Mystery of Edwin Drood while I was still in my 20s, just because I happened to meet uh, Wilfred Leach, who was uh, a director and basically my mentor. Wow. Well, anyone who has watched any of your shows knows that you are really talented. And when you, um, I, one of the things that I think is worth telling the audience listening today is that we met Bob Shaw way before any, actually before Newport had even really been officially selected as one of the locations for the filming of the Gilded Age. And we met him because this man is a historian as well as an artist. He was here in Newport looking very carefully, well beyond even a curator would look at our rooms and picking up on details in our rooms. And I now can understand what you were doing was trying to put your own rooms together for Gilded Age. Talk us through a little bit about what it takes to 
put a room together and what you were looking for when you uh, walked through all of our houses. And by the way, those in the audience, uh, Bob walked through our houses thousands of times, took hundreds of thousands of pictures, studied them in order to translate what he saw here into the set that is on Long Island and then to make decisions about how filming would be here in Newport. So tell us a little bit about the research side of the job. Well, I started research, but mostly looking at books and looking at pictures and, and um, getting a feel for things. Um, I also, I listened to a lot of audio books and I uh, started listening to, uh, I think it's Fortune's Children, which is a sort of history of the Vanderbilt family. Yeah. And at a certain point, I realized I needed to go to Newport for a sense of scale. And you can look at the photos uh, in a book or online and not have a sense of, of scale and, and the, enorm the enormous size of the rooms and, and the heights of the ceiling. So uh, the show had an interesting um, gestation. I have a phone I need to turn off. <laughs> um, uh, that um, it was originally gonna be on NBC. And uh, I think uh, they felt that it was a little uh, more ambitious than they even realized after we sort of gave them an idea of what was going to uh, be involved. And um, the show uh, was sort of set aside. They put a pin in it, as they said, on a Thursday. And I had already arranged a trip to Newport um, on the following day, on the Friday. So I went uh, and spent uh, a long weekend in Newport. Um, and our art department coordinator had contacted the Preservation Society and somebody arranged uh, you know, a couple tours and I got to go to places that were off the, off the public uh, tour like the, um, the servants' quarters at Marble House and even getting a sense of the idea of um, the difference between um, the scale of the, of the servants' quarters, uh, Marble House, and then 10 years later, how things were, were a little more humane. <laughs> You know, at at, uh, at the elms so, because I would say the hallways are more than twice as wide and and um, so it's really a sense of scale and but the sh when I visited Newport the first time the show was officially on the shelf and uh, yeah, right. I hope I hope that I could sort of somehow will it back into existence and I continued listening to everything that I could about about the Gilded Age and uh, continuing to to look at. At, at pictures and things, did a, the Sopranos movie in between. And then by the time that was finished, uh, uh, gratefully the uh, Gilded Age had landed at HBO and I'd worked at HBO a lot. And I know that they always do things, you know, first class. So that was a, a, a happy thing, but I spent the, the six or more months when the show was officially on hold, um, continuing to read and continuing to look at things. Right, and when you're looking at things, you're looking at real details, uh, the, the staircase and the curlicues going up the stairs and that sort of thing, which we've tried to sometimes identify uh, parts of the Gilded Age, thinking it was, this is definitely the staircase of the Elms, and then concluding that, no, this is a creation of Bob Shaw. <laughs> well, it's it, interesting because uh, you learn that the architecture changes a lot, even within a decade. And when we decided, uh, the, some, some of the early research I was doing uh, was uh, of the Petit Chateau, because it was fairly clear that Bertha Russell was uh, a sort of stand-in for Alva Vanderbilt. And- And tell our audience what the Petit Ch Chateau is. That's the New York The Petit House. Chateau was the uh, sort of the, the, the first one out of the gate if, uh, in um, sort of upping the ante for the for the size and the level of opulence um, of the homes of the of the wealthy people in New York. Uh, prior to that, Mrs. Astor uh, was the vanguard of society, and uh, their philosophy was uh, that you should not flaunt your wealth on the street. You, the interiors might be fairly lavish, but your house should look fairly unassuming. So Mrs. Astor's house was what I always refer to as a plus size brownstone, but it was a, a brown box. You know, the, the Edith Wharton always referred to New York at that time as having been dipped in chocolate. And right. she was probably the, the, uh, the tastiest morsel of that era uh, in chocolate. But um, uh, it really started with Mary Mason Jones 
uh, in the late 1870s, uh, building out of limestone instead of brownstone. But uh, the Petit Chateau was a very French model. Um, I always say that the old money wanted to be English and the new money wanted to be French. Right. And, um, and so it was sort of this uh, sort of Loire Valley castle of Chateau suddenly plunked down on Fifth Avenue and it had turrets and, and uh, all that sort of thing. It's funny because when I started, uh, Lord Fellow said um, he would be very happy if what we ended up having could look like the Duke Mansion um, on Fifth Avenue, which is later. It's about 1910, I think. Right. And I thought things had already begun to have settled down and show some signs of restraint. And, um, and then I was sort of uh, salivating over the idea of creating the Petit Chateau with the turrets. And then I had a first meeting with Michael Engler, uh, the uh, principal director of the show, and he was like, I don't want turrets. <laughs> and so <laughs> um, it became clear that it was going to have to be a hybrid. And um, so uh, it was, a, we started drawing and then somewhere in the drawing process, we realized that um, we were going to be utilizing certain uh, rooms in certain parts of the Newport mansions. Uh, one of the first things I said on my on my job interview before I even had the job, um, I said, unless you plan on having a ball in every episode, don't build a ballroom. It's it's big, expensive, and it's going to take up like all of your stage space. And there are so many houses with beautiful ballrooms. And um, it's interesting that we ended up in the music room with the breakers because that wasn't our original plan and things kept changing. Mm. And um by some chance, I had totally uh, been captivated by the, uh, the sconces that are attached to the columns in the music room at the, uh, at the breakers. And I used that device in the dining room of our Russell mansion on stage. And it just so happened that it tied everything together nicely because there were certain themes in our dining room that were the same as the music room but at the time it was designed we didn't know that we were going to be using the music room and while we were shooting it uh, Julian said it was very clever to use the same details and I was saying it was just it was really just happenstance it, it was not pre-planned um, but it, it, it I think it worked very very well well your observation tell us a little bit um, just to, you referenced the Joneses I think it's important for people to understand the expression keeping up with the Joneses came from Mrs. Jones herself, right? Yeah, well, the Mary Mason Jones was um, the aunt of uh, um, Edith Wharton and the character yeah. of Mrs. Mingott in um, The Age of Innocence was based on, um, on her aunt. And she was definitely her own, her own woman. And uh, her husband uh, had passed away and he had invested in real estate and, and bought a lot of property that was much further north than anyone was wanting to build at that time. So she truly uh, was on the cutting edge when she said, no, I'm going to build up here. Um, I think, uh, War I don't know the exact quote, but Wharton refers to her sitting in her wait window waiting for society to come up to her. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, but she was the only person who built there. And I think it was about 1878 that um, she opened the house, but she built, I think it was six houses and they were all of limestone in the French style. Uh, so she would originally let out the other houses and so that she wasn't up there completely on her own. And so she built sort of part of a block, but um, she- When you walk into, when you walk into Mrs. Russell's house, mm -hmm. uh, the impression you get watching the show is that that's the first time that anyone in New York has ever seen such a grand entranceway. That was what you were aiming for, right? Yes, um, and one, there, there are certain very sort of practical considerations uh, when it comes to laying out the space. So I'd looked at the staircases of so many great homes, but most of them, say for example, um, Marble House, it's got, uh, two stages, the stair goes up, there's a landing, and then you're looking at the underside of the stairs uh, on, on the rest of the trip to the, to the second floor. And that does not give a very dramatic reveal of someone. They sort of appear around a corner. 
So one of the things that's not typical of the architecture of the time is to try to pre present them at the top of the stairs in full figure. So it's, it's more of an entrance. And um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the uh, um, Stanford White influence, that would be something you would see more in the Metropolitan Club, which was a public space. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that these wealthy people didn't want someone to stand in their front hallway and then see the, the, the corridor that led to their bedroom. Um, mm -hmm. But we made that, that, that decision. And then when we decided to go to Newport, even the fact that most of Newport is 10 years later or more than our story, certain things had changed. And the, the balustrade, the railing um, at the Petit Chateau or the things that were being built at that time were mostly st stone or limestone or, or some kind of masonry. And the vogue for a metal staircase, metal balustrade, wasn't really um, happening until the 1890s. So even a 10 year difference um, made that big change. But I decided that we needed to have that sort of railing in the Russell house because I knew we would be seeing the Elms and we'd be seeing, you know, uh, Marble House and places that had this slightly later vogue for, for a metal, uh, metal balustrade, so. Well, we did, did the breakers as an entrance way ever, uh, and that staircase, did that ever get considered? It or seemed, is that it just seemed with the too, too, too much, too much, uh, even in terms of space. Um, we're yeah, pretty, yeah, um, we're pretty, um, our ceiling in the main entry hall is 32 feet. Uh, but I think the, I think the breakers is close to 50. I don't remember. It's just, I, it it's is just, 50. yeah, yeah. It's so enormous that it seemed out of our reach just in terms of the practical use of stage space. And we always have to consider how often are we gonna see something? We had designed a butler's pantry that went behind the dining room of the, um, of the Russell stage set, but um, it was decided that we weren't gonna be seeing it enough um, so that we decided it wasn't cost effective for us to build it. We built, we drew and did a model of a whole kitchen. Um, and it was going to be very, very expensive because we were going to have tiled the ceilings and the, and, and the walls um, as, as in the Elms. And then David Crockett, our producer said, you know, let me look at how many days we're filming in the kitchen. And even though we have a lot of, of, of scenes in the kitchen, it didn't seem worth it to spend literally like $3 million to, to build this, um, uh, this kitchen. And um, then we decided to use the elms. And I had been concerned a little bit that even though it's spectacular and impressive and very, very film friendly, it's over a hundred years old. <laughs> and so um, I was concerned that it, would, that it would not look new on camera. Um, and uh, with a tiny bit of visual effects help, um, it, it's kind of spruced up just enough, I think, to, to sort of pass as the, the new Russell Kitchen on film. Yeah, we're very pleased that you're, the Russell Kitchen is the Elms Kitchen. I'm glad that it was too expensive to build. You know, any, anyone, um, I, I think you could have been an architect as well as a designer because um, the rooms that you have created are just as grand and glorious as anything that Richard Morris Hunter Stanford White did, Bob. I mean, you're almost uh, better than those two great artists. Oh, I, 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 yes, I don't know about that. Because actually, the more now that we are um, shooting um, uh, scenes that we can't disclose um, for season two in Newport, the more I look at some of the homes in Newport, the more I think, oh, our, our, our stuff is just not going to be up to the level because oh. um, it's, it's, so, um, it's so, so many spaces are so large and so spectacular. No, I, I think I, I love the fact that on uh, all of the discussion pages about the Gilded Age, there's so much argument about which room is which and which room is real and which room is the, the set. And you have us all fooled, except I will say that, um, you know, I've seen thousands of pictures of our houses by many different photographers around the world. I have never seen uh, the, the music room, um, even the Elms breakfast, the kitchen, uh, any of the rooms that you have featured in the Gilded Age come across as beautifully 
I mean, the, the filming of the rooms is glorious too. And it, it certainly helps, um, I don't know, encourage people to want to see some of the Newport mansions because they are really, really over the top and you can't see them anywhere else well, in America. I credit you with um, realizing that very, very early on when we first approached um, uh, you guys about um, filming there and using some of the, some of the rooms, um, you were very aware of the idea that if the show was successful, this could really help stimulate interest in the period and in the architecture. And um, we, we deal with a lot of people who have, uh, you know, a lot of concerns about their locations that we, and the idea that you, you were very, very quick to, to see it, the opportunity. And, and I think it's really kind of worked out that way. So credit to you for that. Well, let, let me give the credit back. Just so for, for the sake of our listeners, many museum professionals, as Bob knows, are very reluctant to have Hollywood uh, film crews come into their property because uh, they're afraid that their rooms will get disrupted. And uh, our experience with HBO and with all of you has been phenomenal. There's great respect for the fact that you are working in a museum setting. Uh, our curators are on site, so they're working in companionship with all of you. We have had no problems at all. So uh, having the aspiration early on of having filming done, some would say was a little rash. It's turned out to be fine for us. And it has really, uh, you've piqued people's interest too. For example, um, you use the billiard room in, um, the breakers, but you put a fake fire in one of the fireplaces. And so of course I had many emails from people saying, how on earth could you have allowed HBO to put a fire in that fireplace? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't read any of that stuff. And, um, our decorator from season one, Regina Graves, who did an amazing job and who uh, is, is so talented, started sending me uh, little things that she'd seen online and things like someone saying, well, clearly this isn't marble. Clearly this is painted. And, <laughs> and, and, and this does not look like Stanford white and all that sort of stuff. And, and I said, my first question is, why are you reading this? Yeah. And my second question is, why are you sending it to me? Um, I hear bits and pieces. Um, I mean, you you have to take the good with the bad. If you if you, if you it, they always say if you believe your good reviews, you have to believe your bad reviews. So um, I, I I just don't don't really uh, listen to it. But um, I do hear things like people saying, "Well, that was clearly a set," and they're talking about when we filmed a scene at the Sleepy Hollow Country Club, which was a Vanderbilt mansion and was was not a set at all, and we did very little other than refurnish. And um, the people online saying that they were absolutely certain that that was a set. And then they pointed out the various things that were fake about it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and of course it was real. Well, I, I think that um, overall um, the, the real Gilded Age um, aficionados are gonna be more critical than anybody. But I think that their critiques have really toned down as we got towards the end of the show, because they do know that the, um, the benefit is if you care about this aspect of history, um, there hasn't been a lot of attention anywhere to this era. And what you're doing is promoting an era that Americans don't know much about. And there's a value to that. So maybe we do take the good with the bad yeah. or the bad with the good. I don't see any bad at all, Bob, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> I love it all. And I, I think that's, generally the reaction of the average citizen watching the show. Well, for Beautiful me, work. The downside is if, if I decide that there's something that I'm not happy with or that I don't feel it was proportioned the way it should have been, uh, it becomes part of your permanent record. And um, there, there are, I'm not gonna say what they are, but there are many, many things that I would change or many things that I would tweak or do differently. Oh, gosh. Well, did you feel the same way about The Sopranos? Did you feel the same way about Mad Men? Did you feel the same way about any of the major TV shows you filmed? Or yeah, people used, to always, or? people used to always say that they didn't want to sit near me uh, at the premiere of The Sopranos. Every year we would have a, a big premiere and often they were, you know, at Radio City or a big place like that. And other people were watching the show and I was going, 
<laughs> and um, uh, I, I think it's I think it's part of the job. And um, one of the reasons the job remains interesting is that um, I was actually joking about this yesterday on the um, uh, on the set. We were we were doing some stuff in Newport, and the crew had a certain kind of problem. And I said, "Well, this is what's so wonderful about our job is that we get to learn new things every day." And I said, you know, and they've proven that your brain will, 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 will stay healthier if it's constantly presented with new tasks and, and new information. And that if you have a repetitive job where you do the same thing every day, they can actually measure that the dendrites start to shrink back. So, so aren't we lucky that we get to have new challenges and learn new things every day? Absolutely. Um, Bob, how many uh, sets are there in the Gilded Age? If you can quantify it, I don't know. I don't know actually. Um, we our builds were large last year, so it wasn't as many small sets because the Russell House includes the the Great Hall and the drawing room and the library and the um, the, the the dining room, and then we the, and the and the kitchen. Um, well, no, no, but that's I'm saying of the thing. Oh. I, I don't know if you're asking about things that we built. Um, because we, no. we built Bertha's room, which was obviously clearly influenced by um, Alva Vanderbilt's um, bedroom at, at Marble House. Right. Um, and people, uh, when we were building this set, they said, well, that's just a very, very large bedroom. And I said, it's not as big as Alva's. It's a little yeah. bit smaller. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, Now, out of curiosity, why did you choose not to use the bedroom itself? Um, or was that too fragile a room and you, I, I don't know. What I explained to, to so many people, the irony is we go to Newport and we go to other historic properties because they're of our period and because they look so great. And then the first thing we have to do is empty out all the furniture and put in our own furniture because people can't sit upon these, uh, you know, antiques, historic yeah. antique fabrics. And um, so that's a little ironic that we say, isn't this room wonderful? And then we empty it out and have yeah. to put our own things in, so. And do you, do you make a decision too about a, a particular site that you know you're going to be uh, in a lot? So it's easier just to have it on location than having it here well, or in Newport or at Lyndhurst or any of the other sites where you film? Well, that's why we built um, the Russell House and we built the Brooke Van Ryn House because we knew that every episode would have scenes in those in those locations. And uh, when you start, whether you're doing eight episodes or 10 episodes, often you ha have an idea of what the first four episodes are and you don't know what's happening in the second half of the season. Uh, often. Really? Yeah. Really? What was interesting about The Gilded Age was that... Um, it had been conceived by, by Lord Fellows a long time before it finally uh, was made. So uh, it was set and the arc of the first season was, was always known. And now um, the second season is really being conceived as we go. He's, he's still writing, we're filming and he's still writing. Um, the, the, we're doing eight episodes and he's still very much working on seven and eight. So wow. we don't really... Um, you, you try to anticipate and then you can it's easy to paint yourself into a corner too because um you decide well we're going to use this uh, room for this and then they write more and you say well i hadn't really planned on on using the hallway or or some some uh it happens on any show um and, and you suddenly you, you're in season two or season three and it's like this room doesn't have a bathroom <laughs> they write that the person walks into their their bathroom, which the, the writer envisions being off off of the main, you know, there, there's not a door in the room that would lead to it. So sometimes you, you say, well, we can't do that. And sometimes they sort of tell you to do it, even though it, it violates continuity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what was it? What was it like? Um, you know, we were all so thrilled and surprised because the first episode started out in Hunter House. Right. Um, what was it like filming in that tiny little jewel box of a colonial house? We love Hunter House. It's what started the, the Preservation first, Society. Yeah. I think that most Newporters have great fondness for that building because it was the beginning of preservation right. here in this city. Right. Um, well, 
fortunately, that was a small scene with only two people. Uh, right. if, if there had even been a third person in the room, it would have uh, created more of a challenge. Uh, but it's funny uh, that I had spent so much time in Newport and had gone to the houses so many times that I was pretty much aware of, of what rooms and what, what places were available. And um, something that didn't come, come through uh, this year was we needed to do a certain scene. And I was saying, we haven't been to Green Animals. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and, and I sort of know which rooms we haven't been in, uh, but we sort of went through the entire Chateau Sur Mer in the first season. When it just kind of makes people, you know, uh, surprised when I hear, well, Agnes's bedroom is in the Chateau Sur Mer. The rooming house where Oscar met John Adams is in the Chateau Sur Mer. Uh, Mrs. Morris and Mr. Morris had their bedrooms in the Chateau Sur Mer. Uh, when when Bertha goes to the um, uh, to, to to leave a card for Mrs. Fish, the front entry of the Chateau Sur Mer is is the place. And then when we're in um, Mrs. Fish's uh, uh, doll tea party, it's the dining room at the Chateau Sur Mer. I think. We haven't really shot in, in, in the ballroom there and we haven't shot in the library there, but you know, there's not much right. left in the Chateau. And I also love, I always tell people that it's, um, they, they never sort of figure out that when um, Bertha goes to visit Mrs. Astor, she pulls up to the Chateau Sur Mer, goes in the door, finds herself in Belcourt. <laughs> and then uh, they push her down the staircase and she, the staircase is in Marble House. Right. And then she goes through the kitchen of Marble House and then she goes back out the back door of the Chateau again. But um, the funny thing is I realized more than a lot of the other people did that we were going to need uh, the Chateau very much because uh, most of Newport really reflects the new money uh, people in our, in our script. And we still have a lot of people who would be considered the old money. Right. Like, like the Morrises and like Mrs. Fane. And um, I knew that the, the Chateau was the outstanding thing you had of that, of that era. Right, perfect, perfect. Um, Bob, you are um, maybe by avocation, I don't know. Um, you have really in your own right become quite a good scholar of the Gilded Age, not with a PhD, but you know the era very well. And that's because of all your reading and research. Why do you think this part of American history has been lost to Americans? This is something that plagues us here in Newport. We do not understand why this era is not better appreciated, better understood, better studied. Um, what, it's just like a lost period until now. Well, it's interesting because how many times have you heard the phrase America comes of age um, in different, in, and it's pinpointed at different times in history. And often it's emerging from World War I. Uh, right. And, and this is when we really put our stamp and that we were a force to be reckoned with and we were, you know, a, a world power. And that really began in the post Civil War era, you know, of the Gilded Age. And the great fortunes that were that were made, and um, I don't know why everyone seems to pinpoint that we suddenly burst on the scene after World War One, uh, and, and I I can't really figure why they don't pay as much heed to the to the uh, the foundations that were laid after the Civil War, um, and, when and the entrepreneurship and the experimentation and the real technology development, railroads, phones, telephones, electricity. Uh, it, it's like we, it was always in our mind, well, that was always there, it's but astounding. it wasn't always there. <laughs> People know Vanderbilt's because, you know, of Gloria Vanderbilt and Anderson Cooper, but um, the story of the, of Commodore Vanderbilt is astounding that he, in one lifetime, it wouldn't seem possible to start basically being a kid growing up on a farm in Staten Island who decided that he was more interested in, in ships and the sea, and, 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 and seafaring uh, world and to then 
go from working on a boat to captaining a boat to owning a boat to owning a fleet of boats to then deciding that he's in the transportation world and he was going to get into this railroad thing. The idea that someone could be living on a farm in Staten Island, one of, I forget, a number of children, Many. and then in one lifetime create the greatest fortune in the world at the time. It's, it's right. unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And it, it is, it's, it is kind of surprising that, um, that people don't know about it. And but it's also com comparable too to the Bill Gates's and the Jeff Bezos and um, the Elon Musk's of today. Exactly. exactly. In terms of this rapid growth, this incredible growth of and income. It, it has the same upside and it has the same downside. And that, um, unfortunately, it, it's interesting. We we do deal with some other properties, and we you know we film in Lindhurst and Tarrytown, and. Um, uh, the curator there, uh, Kristen Silver, is like always defending uh, Jay Gould and saying, people don't know the other side. He was a family man and he was very good to everyone who worked for him. And, you know, people know him as, um, you know, the, the great robber baron who once almost bankrupted the country in an attempt to corner the gold market. Um, so but it's, what I find interesting about this and about making it into a, an, into a, a, a dramatic story or uh, is 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 the upside and the downside, and as much as you could say that um, you think that the character of uh, George Russell is is a ruthless businessman, but a, essentially a good person, that it's almost impossible to create a fortune of that size in that amount of time without stepping on people on the way, <laughs> and and that um, there's so many great things in 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 the. Preservation Society properties. And if you do the Servants Life Tour, um, I took a photograph of uh, the census of who worked in the, in the house at the time. And um, virtually everyone was uh, an Irish immigrant in, right. in when the house first opened. And right. um, that's all very interesting in terms of, you know, so much in, in the current news about immigration and, and you know, people lose lose sight of the fact that no one started here unless you're a native American. <laughs> and, uh, right. Yeah. And, um, uh, and that, you know, the time before our story, um, you know, the Irish were very looked down upon as, you know, what, what are they doing here? Why did they, <laughs> and right. you know, everyone, everyone um, has, has their path, you know, this is where I find the history so fascinating. Well, and also in the servant life tour, you learn that, uh, there is a bureaucracy to working in a house. And the aim, if you're a smart servant, is to try to climb that ladder. And if you climb that ladder successfully, you will end up on top and you're going to be pretty darn good financially and from a prestige point of view. Uh, well, what I, was interesting to me in the changes is um, I feel very fortunate to have seen the servants' quarters at Marble House uh, because they're tiny. And the hallway is is so narrow. I don't think you could pass uh, someone on the way. And um, right, yeah. I think um, I think it was maybe Patty who was telling me that you know it would be something that would be nice to put on the tour, but there are reasons that it's hard to even accommodate people passing through it because of you know fire laws and right and it being accessed by a, st a spiral staircase and that sort of thing. But the interesting part of the story is that from when Marvel House was built to when the Elms was built, which is just a little bit more than a 10 year spread, they had to improve the conditions in order to attract the staff because within a generation, people are moving along and not necessarily going to be in service as they say. And, so and you know that there was a strike of the servants at the Elms, yeah. which was unheard of. That would not have happened in the 1890s. Right. It did happen at the turn of the century. And so they people had, were becoming more enlightened. Workers were becoming more enlightened about their rights or their aspirations and, and being much more forceful and demanding. And we have little bits and pieces in the show that address things like that. There's one moment when um, uh, Marion makes a comment to Agnes about, well, I mean, the servants have to have their own life. And... Um, Agnes, as she's going into the dining room, says, I don't see why. <laughs> and um, 
um, truly this sense of privilege that it was just the natural order of things that people would live in order to wait on her. And um, you see how that how that changed. But it's interesting that there was a that there, there was a, a strike at the Elms because compared to compared to Marble House, those accommodations are deluxe. Right. Yes, <laughs> uh, they over are. How, over how tiny the, the the rooms are in Marble House. Long hours, though. They worked long hours. <laughs> They had maybe an afternoon off, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's 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 so interesting from you know a study of of society and a study of um, where we've been and 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 how we got where we are and and how things change. I think that's what the TV show is going to do for Americans, maybe the world's understanding of the American Gilded Age, and I think that's really why we're so glad you're here now. Uh, this season, you are here in Newport now. We um, This is being filmed, um, taped in early May. Um, tell us a little bit about, I know you can't tell us the storyline, um, but you can tell us where you're filming and uh, things like that, I think. Can well, you? Um, <laughs> we I know can because you, I can tell asked. you where we're filming. I can't tell you what happens there. We're, um, we're, we're back in the Elms and we're using more of the Elms than we did last year. And we're filming in the Chateau again. And um, we're filming in, um, in Marble House, uh, which we uh, barely used last year. We only had that right. little sequence where uh, Bertha sort of went through the kitchen very, very quickly. And um, while we're in Newport, we're, we're at, the, at the casino, the Tennis Hall of Fame again. Good. And um, um, that's just in our first trip here, which is our first three weeks. And then we'll be back in the fall and as I said, we don't know enough about the script to even know what we're doing in the fall. Other than that, we're certain that there'll be more scenes in the in the uh, Russell kitchens. That must be a terrifying job, that of Lord Fellows. He must toss and turn night after night, wondering how he's going to create the next episode. We have great confidence in him, though. Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't know. I know that. Um, the, uh, the the scripts the, the scripts come and then there let's just say there are a few there are a few things that we know will happen in season two that took us all by surprise. <gasps> wow! And, yes, and there are definitely there are definitely things where we're like I didn't didn't see that coming. You wow! Know? Well, he's so. got an imagination that's beyond belief. Bob, um, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, what is your favorite house here in, in Newport? I, you know, I guess really what I'm leading up to is we we had uh, uh, Lord Fellows discuss, talk to our board about three weeks ago. And the thing that came across is his genuine admiration and love for Newport and for these houses. It's not, it's not just something that he says. He knows them well. He likes them very much. He thinks this is a beautiful city. He used the, fur, the, the term, Newport is a village of palaces. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so pretty. It's interesting. What's your reaction to Newport? And you, don't, you can be honest. If you don't like it, tell us. Um, no, I, 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 I love Newport. And the thing that was um, uh, a bit of a surprise to, to, to a lot of us was the area where our hotels are and where we're staying, if we go out, walk around and decide to go out for a coffee or something like that, it's you pass through the whole colonial era of Newport. Everyone knows the Gilded Age and everyone knows the, the cottages. Um, and But I wasn't as aware of how extensive the, the, the preserved uh, colonial era history was, you know, houses from the 1700s and right. houses from the early 1800s. And right. um, it's just kind of, astounding to walk around that part of town and and see all the plaques because every 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 house has a date it's funny in terms of what my favorite house would be there's a thing of what you admire aesthetically and um you, you look at something like the breakers a friend of mine's um I, I make this joke with michael engler all the time that a friend of mine's uh, mother talked about something in a museum and she said it's very nice but it's not for people <laughs> <laughs> and um <laughs> You know, uh, if I were going to live in a house, it would be Isaac Bell. Um, oh, wow! Because, because it's for people, you know. And mm -hmm. it's there. There was um, there was a little bit of a of a disagreement we had because we there was a, a plot that was coming up um, that uh, uh, 
we needed another house and um uh someone was saying what about isaac bell and i said isaac bell is very forward thinking and very modern and the the, the open uh, plan and the way when you open all of the sliding doors is this huge open space which i understand you you at some point had to bring up to modern engineering because even though the open uh, the giant open doors um, looked fabulous that they were starting to sag <laughs> over exactly, the years. Exactly, yeah. Had to, you had to sort of uh, reinforce it with uh, with some steel. Um, but I love that house. Um, it, it, it seems to, it would be someone's dream house if they could transport it to the Hamptons. <laughs> and so, right. And, and you know, uh, Vincent Scully, the great art historian from Yale says, it is the finest example of shingle style architecture anywhere in America. And it really is an important house architecturally because it's a transition house. It's not Victorian, even though it was built in the 1880s, early 1880s. Uh, it was uh, breaking loose with open spaces and lots of light and not defying Victorianism and saying to incoming architects, come on, design like me now, we can do something new. Right. And that's Which I always figured the... must have been the reason why you chose not to use Isaac Bell, because it isn't a pure 1880s Victorian house. It's modern. It's very, it's very modern and it's very forward uh, looking and uh, it, it doesn't, it, it feels like already breaking out of our, out of our era. And, um, but I, I love that house. <laughs> and, um, um, put it, put it on the ocean, I'll take it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and did, did you did you all decide? I, I don't know the answer to this. Did you all decide that green animals would not be would not work for this season? Um, I assume that you did. The reason it didn't work is that we were talking about a, a, a party scene and there are too many directions where you look and um, and you don't. Um, there's a contemporary building and particularly with the party scene, you have to be able to look in all directions. And there were too many. Um, and also we were looking at it out of season. So I think if people saw it in season, they might say, okay, well, we'll this is really wonderful. We'll figure out how to make it work. Um, but seeing it in the, seeing it off season and then uh, without trees to cover everything else, it just, it seemed like there were too many production challenges. Right. What was it like filming that ball in the Breakers music room? It that was, must have been unbelievable. Um, an overused word it was magical it um it everything came together we'd been working on from when i started the show assuming also considering that it shut down at one point um it was almost three years from when i was first hired to when we finally finished filming about just exactly three years and to have the culmination of everything end up in this wonderful scene with you know all the beautiful costumes and the dancers swirling around and one of that is one of my favorite rooms in Newport and always had been. Me too. Me and, too. Um, and to feel that it did um, sort of blend with our set and that you could believe that they walked here and they ended up in this room and um, all the characters coming together it was it was it was just a very satisfying way to end yeah. to end the season um, because uh, the, the show ends with the, with the ball and Bertha's social triumph. And we felt like we could all feel that we'd, uh, that we'd done it. <laughs> now, let me ask you, it's almost time to end, but an ending like that for an entire season, does that get driven, I suppose, by uh, the writer, Lord Fellows, or does that get discussed by all of you? Like, gang, we've got to come up with something that's really going to make an impact. And I will then write a conclusion that meets the impact. Um, How does that get done? You no, know, that that was that was um, always uh, part of the it. structure of the season that, that Julian put together. That um, he knew that um, you know Bertha would have her initial defeat of the at home that no one attends, and that uh, the whole season was leading toward her social triumph, and that culmination was the ball. And that was the way he structured it. And I, I that's just what he. Um, had, had come up come up with along the way we 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 sometimes make suggestions that something might be hard for us to do and I mean last season he wrote a scene where people were having a conversation and they were in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and from the point of view of um, 
how much set dressing and where we were going to we're going to make the the Met Museum, which looked different at the time. And it turns out that the scene was not even a full page of dialogue. And so we thought it was it was too much. And that was where someone said, "Hey, you know, our, one of our researchers, Nara uh, Demora, said, um, you know, Bethesda Fountain was was there at the time, and that was literally the only thing we filmed in Manhattan." the entire year was Bethesda Fountain. So that's an example of, of you know, he had written that they were um, in the Met Museum. And I think, you know, we, we thought we couldn't do it because it was too much effort for the length of the scene. And I think being outside in Bethesda Fountain was even better. And, yeah. you know, that's, that kind of stuff happens in terms of the, you know, locations and making suggestions and, um, you know, I can't, you know, do this without mentioning, you know, the amazing Lori Pitkus, who. Oh, we love Lori. We love her. <laughs> and our, our, I mean, she, I, I happen to think that she's the, the best location manager in the business. And she, um, and she um, uh, makes everything happen. But she's also like a very important creative part of the process. And um, we often have to find a way to do things that um, isn't isn't literal. We, we like when we were looking for the, the ferry terminal, the ferry terminal is actually an outbuilding that's a bowling alley at, um, at Lyndhurst. Um, hmm. Separated really? from the property, it's down the hill and there's a bowling alley and it has these sort of two turrets on either end. And I said, you know, I think we could make this into the ferry terminal. And um, everyone sort of, and then I had someone do an illustration and they went, oh, this could work. But every day with Lori, it's like, now she'll say, now call me crazy, but I think that there's enough with the staircase that you could sort of add something to it. So um, she's a you know, tremendous creative partner. Brilliant, brilliant woman and very yeah. creative. Yeah. And so are you, Bob. We could take another 40 or 45 minutes. I hope um, those of you who are listening are watching The Gilded Age and are so proud that HBO selected Newport as a central site for filming. And you have to admit that the work that Bob Shaw has done thus far is spectacular. And we know it's gonna be so in the future. Thank you, Bob. And uh, you. anyone who's interested, he will be in town to give a live speech <laughs> on August 11th, the John Winslow lecture. So you can meet him, shake his hand and ask him questions. And thank you, Bob. Enjoy the next few weeks here in Newport. Newport in May is yeah. beautiful. Yeah. I hope you have a lot of fun and yeah, I hope we see you. each other soon. I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Bye.